live. We are live. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. Hi everybody. How are you doing? How's it all going? What a week, another big week, right? Did you guys watch yesterday's ceremony? That felt, well, it was nice to hear a, a president speak in such mature, inclusive what word tones, don't you think? I thought, I found it very moving. Um, I'm sure a lot of you did. I posted about it today. There are a number of dissenters and I understand people's suspicions um, and worries. So let's see what happens. But it felt like a good step, good first step. At least it did over the pond here. Hi from Tehran. People, all the, all the people are coming. Lisa, I'm good, Lisa. How are you? Um, I'm good. Up and down, if I'm honest. And I can be honest with all of you. I had a day yesterday, I actually had to go into the studio, finish something with Paul Epworth, which was great. But the day before I was, I was down like a dog. I'm, a, I'm not, and today's another, I don't, you know, it's, it's, it's the nature of where we are, isn't it? Hello, Shelby. Hello, Shelby Mead. It's been a while. That's Shelby. Shelby used to do, Shelby's an old friend. She used to do press for us for Radiohead around the time of Kid A and used to spoil us rotten and take us to events. And we always used to get lots of lovely freebies. And she was such, uh, well, you're such a light, Shelby. You, you, you helped us deal with the American media, <laughs> which is no easy feat in itself. Not, not like where we were at that time. Um, hi, everybody. I'm very, I'm, I'm, um, Good. Uh, Colombia, I'm just saying hi to a few people. I'm very, um, I'm really looking forward to tonight because um, I'm going to be talking to Jim Jarmusch, hopefully. Yeah. So when I was, um, the reason being primarily because of this thing, this book, Stomp Box. And it's a very, very lovely book. It's a beautiful book and it's, it's got loads of stuff with guitarists and musicians and film directors and their favourite guitar pedals. It's, it's real geekery, but it's done really beautifully. And the thing was that I was asked by Ilon um, Paz, who put it together, whether I'd contribute. And I said, um, I said, fire a journalist. I said, yeah, I'd love to. And they said, what pedal? And I said, oh, Electro Harmonics Deluxe Memory Man, which is a delay pedal for all of you who know it. And they said, ah, oh, you can't do that. Jim Jarmusch has already picked that pedal. I was just like, well, I had two things in mind. I was like, fuck it, damn. That, and I was just like, okay. But then I was like, that's cool. That's actually really cool because Jim Jarmusch is one of the coolest film directors on the planet, makes beautiful, beautiful work. And he chose the Memory Man. So that kind of says a lot about the pedal. That says a lot about him. And maybe there's a bit of common ground in the way we feel things. Anyway, so I'm going to bring him in in a sec. But I'm really, uh, I'm really excited. And I'm going to really try and hard, hard not to be a fanboy too much. Um, <laughs> but I'm just going to be myself. And if I'm a fanboy, I'm a fanboy. You know what I'm like. All right, lovelies. I'm going to try and bring Jim in, see if he's around. I think he might be. Um, and I'll see you all, see if he's there. Uh, he's not here yet. Maybe, maybe he's going to come in soon. Um, maybe I'll, I'll try, you know, I'm, ah, here we go. Excellent. Cool. Let's see. I've got to press that. Yeah. All right. Brilliant. Send a request. Um, so yeah. Hey, Hey, Ed O'Brien. It's Tim Jarmusch as I live and breathe. <laughs> wow, well, well, thank you. Well, we're both, you know, I'm fanboy also, so, you know, we'll just keep it in, ch in well, check. Wow. How, how are you doing? How's your day? Uh, I'm doing well. I'm, uh, you know, it's funny, I'm very busy lately, whereas for a while I wasn't very busy, and now I have a lot of things going on, but uh, I'm happy to do this. I'm happy to meet you. 
Yeah, I'm, well, I'm really happy to meet you. I mean, I give you, give you a bit of context about me and what, one of the reasons I'm so happy to meet you. So I'm, I'm born in 1968. So I'm a teenager in the 80s. And your films, Down by Law, Mystery Train, they were like, for us kids, teenagers, who weren't into, you know, and I appreciate the kind of the teen movies of the time and stuff now, but you were kind of like, you were the coolest guy. You were making these films that gave us a slice of America um, that for me, what, it made me want to get on a great, I got on a Greyhound bus when I left school at, in 87. I got on a Greyhound bus and went around America for six months as a 19 year old inspired by trying to see the America that people like you and Vim Vendors in Paris, Texas sort of, you know, projected and, 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 and the cinematic nature of what you did. So thank you for that. Well, thank you for those words. Yeah, I don't know. Um, you know, you just were mentioning the, uh, the memory man and how maybe it, uh, there's something that we share for, for for having our love for that particular device. And, uh, and, you know, I think that's just true. Like my approach to filmmaking is I'm still trying to figure out how to do it, you know? And uh, I see what I like are, are artists who are, they consider their work a kind of process rather yeah. than like a signpost, you know? Yeah. And you are definitely in that tribe. So we are in that same tribe of uh, exploring and finding our way and uh, trying to go forward, um, embracing mistakes, you know. So, yeah, I think we're, we're aligned in a, lot, in a lot of ways. So it's really nice to meet you. It's I, great. To I, I feel like calling you by your full name always, Ed O'Brien. Um, yeah. For a few reasons, a few people... Like I always call Bill Murray, Bill Murray. I don't really call him Bill. Uh, I've started to do that with a few people. And you seem like Ed O'Brien also because I have uh, your signature Strat I've had for a few years. Oh, wow. Yes, yeah, so I'm always in my household, my guitars are all female, you know? Yeah. And so I was asked recently, like, oh, I I'm gonna play, I wanna play Ed, Ed O'Brien. And I was asked, well, is Ed O'Brien female? And I said, yes, she is. So I hope that's okay with you. <laughs> I love that. I, I, one of the things I'm, I've always been very aware of is like my feminine side. So I'm always kind of like, I think growing up, you know, I, I was always in touch with my feminine side. So I'll, t I'll definitely, Jim, I'll take that from you. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's a compliment. But I, I, I love the Strat. I have my own. I have the Jim Jarmusch signature Strat also, which of course there's only one of, because it's my it's my guitar, right? Yeah. But do you do you remember Mad Magazine? Did you? Yeah, uh, of course. So I have this thing where here I'll show you if you can see. You remember Spy versus Spy? Yeah. So can you see my? Can you see those guitars? Yeah. I can't see the bottom. I can see the. I can see my one. I can see the strap, and then there's the black one. Yeah. Yeah. I can see the neck, but not the body. Oh, really? I don't yeah. know where. I can see the. I can see the body. There we go. Okay. I'm in the middle. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. Look at that. Like that little kind of around the. Um, what's that? What are those around the around the, oh. the kind of the lining? Uh, well, I have the guard. It's made by um, Cindy Guitars. She's a friend and works out of Carmine Street Guitars, the great Rick Kelly, wow. who builds guitars in New York. There's a great film I should plug called Carmine Street Guitars. Yes. So Cindy made my, uh, it's a leather guard for my Strat with little uh, studs around it. Very kind of biker oriented. She's really does amazing work and builds guitars too now. So I have Spy versus Spy on my strats. Nice. Do you, are, you, are you like a, cause, you've, cause I know that you do, I mean, so my wife and I actually, it's been really great. I slightly digress for a moment. Knowing that I was gonna talk to you, we've had a little kind of Jim Jarmusch season over the last week and a half. And we've gone through a lot of your films, which I actually <laughs> have to, I would, do you know what? I really recommend it to anybody at the moment because we found it to be, it's so calming what you the the, the 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 there's a serenity in a lot of your films that 
has really actually really helped us at this time in a funny kind of way with all the kind of the up and downs as a kind of that the cinematic I think the cinematic nature of a lot of your stuff a lot of your film kind of you allow things to breathe there's space there's air you allow things to happen and I think it's so it that's what I thought I we we've certainly really needed this time but um uh, what was I? Sorry, I digress slightly. I always no do digression this. is is my middle name. So. Yeah, I always get <laughs> off the point, and and there was a reason. And I I, th I think um, oh yeah, of course. What I said. So you you have you because you do a lot of the soundtracks now, don't you? I noticed on Patterson, and so is it Squirrel your 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 outfit? Yes, Squirrel is uh, myself and Carter Logan, and we've yeah. also worked with Shane Stoneback. And uh, Josef van Vissum, the wonderful lute, uh, lute wow. and guitarist from uh, the Netherlands. So, yeah, that's sort of our, our basic squirrel members. Uh, do, you, do you gig and stuff like that? Or is it just purely recording and cinema, you know, doing? Well, it's hard to set up. We don't tour or gig very often, although Carter Logan and I over the last years have done quite a few shows where we do live scores to the silent um, surrealist films of Man Ray from the Wow. Film. So we do an hour long, uh, over an hour long show. We, we're hoping to do a Euro little European tour this year, but it keeps getting, as you know, pushed yes. back. So we do that. And then sometimes we play gigs where it's not the uh, instrumental accompaniment to films. It's just our own wild shenanigans uh so we we love playing live but it's a little hard also it has to be sort of uh, organized between other work and the films yeah. that we make and so carter and i work together too on the films he's a, a producer so yeah we love to play live but it's not that often but hopefully this we do have uh, shows lined up now i guess for this fall in in europe Wicked. Is it, is it kind of, so you're saying is it improv? You just kind of, you're jamming as you go along? Well, not really. Uh, we have a map. We use, yeah. I play uh, guitars, effects, loops, some keyboards. Carter plays drums, uh, keyboards, synths, some effects, um, loops as well. Uh, we have a definite map that we follow for each film because we've played them, uh, uh, we've played to them quite a lot. Yeah. But it's never the same, you yeah. know, so there's... Uh, there's room to breathe always and how we feel. So it gets, it's different, but we also, it's not totally improvised. And uh, it's is like the, um, it's the memory, because the memory man for me, just back to the pedal, just because I want, I just wanted to, the memory man for me is always, it's a key thing live. And the thing I love about it, and very much so in, in you know, in Radiohead territory, we don't have any backing tracks or anything. Everything is, and, and that, it's not jammed, nothing's jammed, but there's enough space within the framework of the songs, particularly that it can be different. And like, I know, cause I read your little, what you said about the Memory Man and the Stompbox book. And I totally, totally agree with what you said about the little, it's so nuanced, isn't it? A little turn can, it turns into something else, something else opens up. And that's the yeah. beauty of it. Well, it's interactive within yeah. itself. I, I, d I stopped using it live because I found I had to keep photographing it with my phone yeah. to remember the pedals, the, the knobs. And then if particularly the blend knob was a little off, <laughs> it wasn't the same thing. And, yeah. it, you know, it's very, it's very complicated. But I, you know, I love that. Uh, I have one synthesizer that has no presets, no settings at all. So every time I approach it, I have no idea what it's going to be. And I, I, I like those kind of things. I love that. <laughs> but I, I just wanted to go back and, and I thank you for what you said about, about our films. But it relates to music in a way because uh, I started making films in the, you know, in the early 80s, really, when it was the sort of the birth of MTV and also a lot of quick cutting action kind of movies were popular. And I'm very, I'm a contrarian, you know? So I was like, well, fuck that. Let's go the other <laughs> way. But also it's part of my 
I think I talk slowly. I think slowly. Yeah. I very, I love slow m music, you know? Yeah. I like films that take their time. But it's also something about something you've said too, uh, uh, referring to Miles Davis about like the, the spaces that you don't play are sometimes more important than what you play. So when I approach film, sometimes the elements of the plot that most people would think is very important because it's advancing the story. I have less interest in, I, I like the moments between, you know, I yeah. like the people <laughs> in many films, like I made a whole film uh, with people in taxi cabs, right? Yeah, yeah. In most films, it's like, well, they get in the cab and then you <laughs> cut and they get out, you know? But I, I, I don't care about them getting in or out. I just like the moments in between. So yeah, I, I, like, I like that kind of, I like spaces and, I love that thing, like when we were watching um, Limits of Control, like how does he get into the place? And the next moment he's in there with Bill Murray. And the same thing with Down by Law, how did they escape? You just, you're next, and I think that's genius. I also got to say, which I really, just a little thing that I love. I love your fade, your fades to the scene. And it's like, again, it's a very kind of, it's very gentle. It's like, and it's like, I mean, I don't know, we, it's like, it's, Remind, I, I feel like a lot of your films could be plays. You could see them on that. They've got that. They've got that. That intensity of of the interaction between characters and these gentle fades, and you're on to the next scene. You know. It's, well, I like the. I like the. I like respiration. I like. Yeah. Out. yeah. I don't like being hyperventilated. I don't like these movies where. I mean, I like all kinds of films, so I do like action films, and some I think. The Terminator, for example, that's a masterpiece, you know, yes. but uh, but this idea that no shot should be on the screen longer than three seconds, man, it gives me a migraine after a few yeah. minutes, you know. Have you seen them? Um, I'll tell you what was on TV recently in Britain that was brilliant was Steve McQueen's series of short films called Small Acts. Have you seen those? Oh, yes. I love them so much. I love Steve McQueen. I got to say... Uh, the one that is Lover's Rock, The House oh my Party. God. Oh. It has everything about human nature, romance, violence, men, women, misunderstanding, love of music, yeah. isolation of a culture, racism, uh, misinterpretation of people, miscommunication, love, you know, beauty. Uh, he does that all with it. It's just one little metaphor of this house party. I mean, I, I love all of them, small yeah. acts, but that one I've seen twice because I, I just found it remarkable. I, I, and I, I agree with you. I think like uh, uh, he has. I think you share that thing where you allow long shots. And you like for me, like when I watch small acts, I went into when I watched Lovers Rock. I went into the studio the next day and I went in to the people I was working with. And I said, I'm so inspired by what I've just seen. These long shots that allow things to develop. They allow, you know, and I have to say I, that, that moment in Lover's Rock when they, they do the whole of Kunta Kinte dub, that track. And they don't, he doesn't just the whole track once. He does it twice and when they repeat yes. it. And it <laughs> yes, but, he edited it. it, it I, extended I, just it. Yeah. fucking genius. And I, I, I think, I, I tell you what, I think that, I think you both share, uh, you both, what I love him, I think, what I'm, the reason I brought him up is because I get the same thing in your films, like, you know, watching Down By Law, you allow the couple to dance the whole track in, the, in Luigi's Tin Shack or whatever, you know. It's, I love that. It's, 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 it's real, it's human. And, and, and for me, as a musician, I find that so inspiring. And it goes back to things like, the, the memory man, which for me, you know, I, 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 said, to, I said to someone two days ago, I'm, I'm speaking to, to Jim Jarmusch, which is really cool about, and I said, if I could describe Jim's films as a guitar pedal, I would say the deluxe memory man, because it's, it's got space, it's got magic, it's got, it's cinematic, and it's, 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 yeah, there's a real beauty. There's a beauty to, and you know, so I'm, you know, I'm really kind of like, you know, I, I, uh, it's really nice to be able to connect with you about this because it makes total sense that you, you know, as a fan of your work, that would be the pedal that you would be most inspired by. 
Yeah, well, I like, we have a little, we have a joke in Squirrel, me and Carter, which is, you can't have too many delays on your board. <laughs> I'm with so, you. <laughs> we each have three or four, and yeah. sometimes we're running them all, you know, yeah. I, don't, I don't know what's going to happen. But I'm, uh, I'm addicted to delays, and my thing is, like, I like delays for me, like, I'm, a, I'm really, I'm probably like yourself, but like, they're all like characters. So you've got like the Strymon timeline, who the Strymon timeline is like the upright, you know, alpha male who is delay, who can do everything and he's really solid and he's brilliant. And then you get all these other delays. And, and I agree, they all have their own character. They all have their own. And I've got, I'm, I'm, I, you know, it, I've got a bit of a problem, if I'm honest. I will, you know, I've just bought another delay pedal. Well, I know I was, yeah, another in fact, I was given it by Roland. It's a Boss DD3, the reissue of the first delay pedal I ever had, a digital one. And uh, yeah, I just, I agree with you. Four or five delay pedals on at the same time, you know. Well, I have, you know, Earthquaker devices. I have a beautiful, like, Caitlin Brad, Caitlin Brad, Echo Rack. I love you know, that. I have a lot of beautiful ones, but I also have one very cheap Chinese one that someone just gave me that I love too because it has gain in it that it shouldn't. Yeah. So there's some dirt that comes with it, but together with its delay quality is very good, you know? So yeah, they're all very different. Did uh, you um, do you ever use tape delays? Like would you use Echoplexes or, you know, any have you used those? Uh, we used them in the studio some years ago when Shane, Shane Stoneback had had some, but yeah. uh, no, I don't have any really vintage uh, tape stuff. I just have um, replications of them in pedals, you know? I really like them. Um, I'll tell you the one, because I, for me, kind of like the tape, the tape delay is, again, it's, it's when I, when I plug into a tape delay, like an Echoplex or even the, um, there's the reissue, there's the guy over in California who does those, his uh, tape tube echo. I can't, people will know what it's, it's a big, big modern tape echo unit. And there's something that you just, it makes you want to play right. I mean, I, I like the memory man, but what's interesting with the Echoplex is Catalan Bread, I don't know, Catalan Bread have done the, have you got the, I'm getting a bit geeky here, but the Belly Pock Deluxe. No, have I you, have, hold on. Great. You've got you've got the you probably got the Echo Rec, is it? I the, have the Echo Rec. Yes. Yeah. So the Belly Pop Deluxe is basically the same the same power circuit as the EP3. It boosts the voltage up and then brings it back down, and so it's got all the circuit. And the only thing that's different is rather than it being tape, it's got a digital component. But there's something about the power shift. And this is what I love about pedals. I'm not a technician. Um, but there's something about what happens in the power circuitry that makes, that helps the magic. And people like, um, so for instance, people like Jimmy Page and all that lot in the 70s, they'd have an echoplex on stage. And sometimes they wouldn't even have the delay on, but they'd have the signal going through the, mm. through the echoplex just to make the sound it makes it, it does something to the sound, whether it's a compression or something, but it, it, it's kind of like, it's almost, for me, I've got it at the end of each, I've got two amps and I've got one last in, last in line. And it's just like framing a picture. It's, or it might be like the final treatment that you might have on a film that suddenly kind of like, it just makes everything sort of jump out. And I, I really, really recommend the Catlin Bread uh, Belly Pop Deluxe. And they also do the, because uh, the preamp in there is so good. Yeah. Well, it's amazing what just a little touch of preamp does to think. Yeah. I got to give a shout out though, because my Catlin Bread Echo Rec was a gift. Uh, I was visiting a couple of years ago, uh, Charlotte Kemp Mall and, and Sean Lennon. And I was talking to Charlotte about having trouble getting a certain vocal sound that in my little home recording stuff. And she said, oh, you need this echo rack. And then she said, you need this bullet microphone, which is yeah. like the harp players use. Yeah. And, and she gave them to me. She said, no, no, we have extras here. Please take these. <laughs> and I use them ever since. So I got to so thank you, Charlotte. But uh, yeah, it really replicates various 
tape heads, like it can have one or two or three heads. It sort of yeah. imitates something. I don't know the original Echo Rec, but yeah, uh, I've I've got an original Echo Rec. It's called it's a Binson Echo Rec, and it's what Pink Floyd used around Medal and around Dark Side of the Moon, I think. And it they, it was an Italian company, and I've got I've got an original one that's been refurbished. It's amazing, and they've got these spinning inside the middle. It's got this spinning metallic disc with like, I think, four heads on it, four heads. And, um, and that's the original. And wow. you can't, it's, 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 an extra, it's an extraordinary beast. It needs a lot of labor. You know, you have to clean it a lot, like a lot of these things. But that's, yeah. what, that's what the Echo Rec, and it was an Italian firm. And there's a, there's a company over here, I'll give a shout out to Soundgas, who I buy a lot of secondhand gear. And they're, they're, they started off as specialists of the Echo Rec. And they're amazing, and it's sort of instant. Um, I, when I hear it, I hear Sergio Leone, I hear spaghetti westerns, I hear, you know, not only does it, it's a great delay, but it's got this function called swell, which is a great. And swell is like the most beautiful kind of reverb you've heard. It's mm. really, really gorgeous. So yeah, the Echo Rec is. I know because I've got the Catlin Brett. I mean, I've got obviously got a lot of pedals. I I love that. They've done it. They always do a really good job on it, on, on what they do. Yeah, it's very beautiful. And I like mixing it with some other other delays, you know. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So yeah, you... I love delay. And of course, I like a little dirt. I like distortion yes. and fuzz. But uh, my favorite thing is delay and various reverbs. And then so... I like to dirty them up as well. So were you part like when you because you live you've always lived in New York, right? Is that? You well, I, I'm from Akron, Ohio, but I've lived in New York since I escaped from there in my late teens. So, were you were you always so you were around kind of like that whole scene of the were you, were you in part the whole CBGBs all of that was that part of your yeah yeah that's I sort of grew up in CBs and uh, Max's too the end of yeah. Kansas City and then CBGBs and. Uh, you know, I was around for the, the Mud Club, Danceteria, all those periods. Uh, so, yeah, I kind of grew up. I used to go to CBGB's all the time, you know, and I, I just, it was just for me so exciting to see people that weren't there, like they weren't planted there by corporate yes. radio. You know, <laughs> they didn't have ambitions to be on major labels even. So... Yeah, it was really, really exciting for me. And it informed my uh, my work in, in everything I do, filmmaking as well, because yes. it, it just was, it doesn't matter what other people are doing. You don't have to be told that you must be a professional. Yeah. You know? And Amos Poe kind of inspired me to make films. Like, well, you just get a camera and go out in the street with your friends, you know? Yeah. So I still consider myself an amateur filmmaker. And I'm definitely an amateur musician. I'm, I'm not a guitarist. For me, guitars are sound generators. I mean, of course, I played for quite a few years, so I know a lot of chords. I, I play a lot of bar chords. I, I play a lot of odd things, you know. Uh, but to me, it's like I approach it to see what... I, I'm always excited to see what will come out of the thing. You know, it's yeah. very mysterious to me. And... Uh, but I really kind of a beginner in terms of technique. But what is technique anyway? I mean, I, I know it's, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to be facetious about people that really know an instrument and then break the rules of it. Yeah. But I, I sort of jumped from all that and I just break the rules <laughs> from, from the yeah. start. So I like when uh, Iggy, years ago, he said, he said, um, Bar chords, he said, yeah, I call those cheater chords. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm a cheating guitarist, you know, but I, you know, I can listen to one note and vary things. Also, I'm a feedback fanatic. Yeah. So I, am, I know I, you I, are, yeah. Piece from the same pod. I mean, like, I don't, I'm, I'm completely self-taught. I, I had some lessons about 12 years ago because I was slightly frustrated. I wanted to move and I wanted to learn some finger picking techniques. But I'm exactly the same. The way that I've, I've sort of thought about the guitar is 
it's a sound generator. It's the start of something. And, that, and it can be, and also, you know, for me, um, I'm as influenced by yourself as a filmmaker, as Steve McQueen. Brian Eno is a huge influence for me as a musician. Like, you know, he always said you can play one note and play it. And, um, but obviously... Well, he's an know, influence to me as a filmmaker, you know. To totally. I use the oblique strategies every day, you know, for something. Ah, yeah, And wow. what I love, Eno is so important, as is John Cage in a way, because yeah. they, you know, they were interested... Well, Eno used to say the studio is an instrument. Yeah. So, but Eno's very, I just love that idea of exploration and being open and don't worry about, uh, virtuosity is a beautiful thing, but it's not a necessary thing. And John Cage used to love uh, giving musicians, you know, he had that whole uh, aleatoric idea of chance controlled music and would give uh, musicians instruments they didn't know how to play. Yeah. So that is very inspiring to me, <clears throat> all of that. I, yeah. have, I worked with, I, I got to learn from uh, the New York school poets who are like my godfathers, wow. still uh, godparents. But I studied with Kenneth Koch and he once gave me an assignment. He said, Jim, I want you to translate this poem by Rilke uh, and bring it back in two days. And I said, yeah, but I don't speak any German whatsoever. And he just looked at me and said, precisely. <laughs> you know, so that kind oh, of man. thing, that's what I, I love. That's what I learned from. That must, be, that must have been so amazing. Because that's in the 70s, right? This was in the 70s, yeah, late that, 70s. That must have been so amazing to be brought up and in that kind of, just, just what it must make you, how it must make you feel and think differently and out of the box. You know, because so much of education is about like that, isn't it? And then to meet these people and go, okay, yeah, that's precisely the point. You don't speak any German. Exactly. And, pres and presumably there's a, would it, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sense of humor in all of this as well, right? There's a, it's not po face. There's a kind of, you know, there's, it's, it's serious, but it's, it's, there's humor, right? Well, for sure, you know, uh... I was listening to an interview with an American composer named Ned Roram the other day. And he was talking about his preference for French classical music versus German classical music. And he said, well, French music is, uh, how do you say? He said, French music is profoundly, uh, um, what did he say? French music is profoundly superficial. Whereas German music is superficially profound. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, I get that, you know? So I go for the profound. I like the superficially profound approach. <laughs> and I also have this theory about rock and roll, which is if it's too earnest, it's not good. Like yeah. if there's not something goofy somewhere funny or goofy about, goofy's not the right word, but... Yeah. If it takes itself too seriously, I'm not really there for it, you know? Yeah. It's I, don't, really, it, I don't want to name names because there are, you know, but uh, you too. But there are some bands that seem very self-important. Yeah. And I go for, you know, Iggy Pop or, J or Jack White. I, I think Jack White, with the White Stripes particularly, was, and he's a brilliant guitarist, musician. Amazing. But he, he was showing you not just showmanship, but show offmanship, where he was doing ludicrous. It, it would make yeah. me laugh to see him leap in the air, you know, and play, play a power chord. I don't know. But I, I like that. Anyway, I like things that are profoundly superficial, I guess. Yeah, that's so, so interesting because I know, you know, I know in, with Radiohead, one of the hardest things is, you know, making music rock and I mean, we're not a classic we have our, we've had our rock hard moments or you know the angry song or whatever is always really really hard to do and it it, it it never really works and i guess i can only think i can only think very i mean angry angry bands from britain i'm just trying to think for punk maybe the clash at times were angry they managed to do that the pistols always had they always had a sense of humor i mean 
Leiden, Johnny Rotten always had that kind of Richard the Third thing going on. So it was always a bit tongue in cheek. It was great rock music, great rock and roll. I mean, maybe The Clash were, I mean, you must have seen, I mean, I know Joe Strum is obviously in Mystery Train, but you must have seen The Clash. In, did you go to Bond's Casino and see them around? Well, that? I was on my way to Bond's to see them and I got mugged. And I, oh. and the only time I think I ever got mugged in New York, it was a little traumatic. Uh, oh, man. So I didn't see them at Bonds, but yeah, and I, you know, I love The Clash, and I yes. love, I love, you know, I love all of them. They're real gentlemen and amazing people, and I loved Joe very much as yes. a person. But uh, no, but they, they knew, they knew how to be wild and sort of uh, irreverent on stage, especially, yeah. and they, you know writing songs, Charlie Don't Surf. I mean, some of the things that inspired them, it's not that kind of heavy handed no. self importance, but they also had that thing, which John Lydon too had, which is we mean it, man. Yeah. You know, like we're, we're, we're playing, but we're not just playing around for nothing. Like yeah. there's something behind what we're doing that we believe in strongly. And that's a little different than thinking your music will change the world. Yeah. Or, or that it's very, very important, you know? Well, I, I, I don't know. So. I don't want to disrespect anybody because no. it, there are all, there's room for all things. Yeah. And, you know, as Duke Ellington said, what's good music? If it sounds good to you, it's good, you know? Yeah. So I, you know, um, I listen now to pop music sometimes to see well, what are they doing in pop music, you know? And, and I mean pop, yeah. pure pop music. So sometimes my I'm um, amazed that I will find something really interesting in something that I would, wouldn't, you wouldn't think I would, you know? But uh, I don't know what I'm saying now. Well, I, it's funny. I, have you, I, I know exactly what you mean. I'm not, I, my daughter came in, uh, came into, uh, we had supper, when last last Friday she came up to supper and she said, "There's this girl that's just gone to number one global. Had a global massive hit, and um, she's huge and she's this ex Disney star." And I I was like, "Okay, what? Well, who is this?" And her name is Olivia Rodrigo. Have you heard this track called Driving License? Uh, I think I did. I think my teenage daughter played me that. Yeah, and it's kind of um, yeah, it's it's like there's a certain sound. However, and and I I have a real I can't connect with that sound. However, what I can connect with is at times is that that pop EDM. You know that 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 there was a there was a remix. There was a what were they called? I'm going to digress. Um, but I know what you mean. I I try I I try and listen to everything. I mean I don't get everything, um, but uh, you know and 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 pop has its you know. There's good, there's good, like all things, there's great pop out there as well. There's, you know, it comes in, there's like, who was it? Was it Lennon who said, or no, George Martin who said, there's good songs and there's bad songs and in all yeah. genres. Yeah. So, and it's subjective as to which yeah. you look like, you know. But when I first heard Billie Eilish several years ago, I knew, yeah. oh man, this is really, this is good, yeah. you know? This yeah. Is this is remarkable stuff. And there are other yeah. pop things I think are remarkable. But then I want to go home and listen to Albert Eiler and uh, Anton Webern, And, you know, yeah. I, I like to listen to, you know, Capone and Noriega, hardcore hip hop. I just like a lot of different things. I must say, I'm not, I don't like show tunes. And I don't really <laughs> like the European uh, tradition of, say, they call it art songs. What, what uh, would they be like? Oh, man, you know, classical po poems set to classical music, sort of modern. Yeah. I don't know. I just don't quite yeah. get those things <laughs> at yeah. all. But uh, most other forms, there's, I call, there's always something I can find that I think is interesting. Yeah. They're just genres, you know? I don't like all hip hop. I don't like all reggae, you know, but uh, when the stuff is good, although those are genres I really like, so. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you, cause you've been, you were open, uh, there's two things I wanted to ask you about that are off of this subject, even of music. Um, you went through having COVID and you're okay now, but is it, everything's okay with you and you, you uh, 
How, yeah. how is that in your life affecting your life? Well, I had it back in I had it back in March, and it was it was it knocked me out for a couple of weeks, um, and it was pretty it was pretty intense. Like you know, it wasn't fun, and there was a. And, but but you know, I knew I was going to be okay. I I'm, I keep pretty healthy. I eat well. I'm you know I've spent a lot of time and I've spent a lot of effort. My wife is a kinesiologist, so building up our immunity and having a strong immune system is really important for us as a family. So that's been, but the thing that I found with it is the long, it's got, a, for me, it had a long tail on it and it really affected my vitality and energy for a very, very long time. And I thought I was out of it and then I'd just be down again. And that's the thing that I've struggled with mostly. And you know, the hard bit about that is that when I don't have my vitality, I don't feel creative. And I can accept being ill, I, of course, but if you don't feel like, you know, what, what, what's felt like is I, I, saw, I felt like, oh yeah, I'm getting back and I'm, I'm feeling it and I want to write and I want to do stuff. And then the next, and then I go into another, you know, I'll be a month where my energy is low. So that for me has been the hardest part. And it's the knock-on effect of, of my disposition because for me, you know, music is, is you know, trying to, trying to create new sounds, trying to write. That's the thing that I, that's the thing that I want to do. And if I don't feel like I'm moving forward in that, that kind of gets a bit depressing. You know, if you feel like you don't have the energy to literally pick up a guitar um, and to try and find some some inspiration or you just don't want to do that for me is that, well, what, what, OK, I, I can be a father here and that's great, but I need something else as well. to, to... So that for me has been the hardest part, if I'm honest. Um, just oh, trying boy. to just trying to find the inspiration. I don't I don't know if you've 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 how you found it at the moment, whether, you know, we've been able to write and have you been able to, have you, you know, have you found it an inspiring time? Because, well, I've... sorry. Yeah, yeah, I had a real lag at first. I had a very, I uh, got sort of just depressed by isolation and uh, I had some months that were really rough. And then I, uh, since then I, I found very positive things for my own life, sort of selfishly. Um, I have a, I'm in my home up in the Catskills, uh, up north of New York City, where my office is and where I li used to live most of the time or, or a lot of the time. But my dream's always been to be up here more. Mm. So now I have had the chance to make, I'm sitting in my little art music studio where I can record and uh, make things and write. And uh, so that being up here and sort of separated from the city has been really, really positive for me. Yeah. So now I'm finishing a book of my little uh, collages, the little newsprint collages I've made for years. Um, I'm finishing some poems that I might uh, publish a book of this year later. I'm working on some music. Uh, I'm trying to get some pieces together. I'm very late to send to Josef Van Vissum to do a new record together. Great. Uh, and I'm I'm late. I'm behind on that one. Uh, I've been writing a film, a script as well. So, yeah. After a while, I just got. I just was felt lucky to just be able to work on some things. So. It's been positive. I watched a lot, a lot of films too. I must say. Yeah, I think Which I always in, do. But yeah, I think being in nature is a key thing. I mean, we were in lockdown. We basically our home is in the Welsh hills in Wales in the Welsh mountains, and it's beautiful. But with the kids, they don't want to be there. They want to be in London for yeah. lockdown. And and it's definitely. I mean, you know, I'm. I but the the weird thing is, I I don't feel. I don't. I don't. I'm not complaining because, you know, what's going on with the frontline workers here, as in America, is just unbelievable. And for me, actually, I'll tell you what, this, I started this kind of in isolation thing um, back in the first lockdown. 
and as a way of i i'd never done instagram before i'd never done any of this before and i but what's been really i've actually really enjoyed this connection that you can get this that you can actually build these communities and you know you know that they're the positive aspects of social media have actually really, really helped. Um, I don't do Twitter, but I like, I like this and I like, you know, you can see little groups and the, 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 I think I've, I followed you having followed Patty Smith. I love her, her side. I, I mean, I'm a huge Patty Smith fan anyway. I'm sort of, you know, yeah. As a musician. <laughs> Her Instagram is so uplifting, though, her thoughts each day. Her words, it's just, it's, it's so poetic. It's like, for me, like as a, as a musician and somebody who's trying to write lyrics now, that place, that, that, that place is the place, when my first record, that first solo record, that was the place that I understood that kind of, she was the one, what she was singing, and then in, in, in poets like Walt Whitman and, Walt Whitman and William Blake, that place, that 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 perspective, that power, and she does it. She does. She does it. She's in that tradition of Whitman and 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 Blake, isn't she? She's got that that spirit, which she has. That yeah, that indelible spirit. The other, and also she can't be categorized because yes, yeah. she's a a poet, a writer, a musician, a photographer, an artist. You know, she can't. Yeah. You can't really keep her in a cage in any way. But also what I really love about Patty, and this comes from, you know, Joe Strummer, Strummer's Law, all of Joe's friends, we always used to repeat Joe's, Strummer's Law is no input, no output. And so to uh, appreciate what others have given or speak to you, have yeah. spoken to you, and celebrating that, is very important, and Patty is always celebrating other artists that have moved her music, uh, travels, things in the world. So, yeah, she's really uh, she follows that law of getting you know input for her output, and I, I just find her really valuable. But I'm yeah. like you, I, I just started the Instagram thing pretty much during all of this. I don't have, I'm not on Facebook, Twitter. I don't even have a laptop. I use, you know, iPads and stuff. I do not have personal email even. So I'm very s suspicious of all of this social media. I don't mm -hmm. like being monitored everywhere and I don't like its effect in many ways. But having said that, man, I have connections to people I didn't even know on Instagram yeah. that are now my friends, are yeah. their, their ideas, things, their input is very important to me. You know, it's like very, I don't know if important's the word, but it's very inspiring. It's like, uh, and, and, you know, meeting someone that you never even knew existed through Instagram, and then suddenly you like their work or their ideas or their art or their thoughts. Or, yeah. I, I find it really, it's been a kind of, it's been a really a great thing in, in a certain way. Uh, yeah. Negative things, of course, you know, but. Yeah. Well, I wanted I, to talk to you about yeah. one thing because you mentioned being in the country as I am yeah. now. And I have been, uh, I've never been a bird watcher, but I've owned my place up here. I've had this for over 20 years. And I became a bird watcher just in my own world, right? So I've identified like 85 birds just in my own land up here. And so I'm very attuned to birds, and I know that you were involved or are involved with this uh, RSPB, uh, a thing about celebrating bird songs. Yeah, I, Can I you helped, just tell me about that because I'm. Yeah, I helped launch it. I mean, I, I'm a massive. Um, I love, I love the country. I love nature. I love, I love bird life. My father, my grandfather, was what they. Uh, do, do you Americans have that? that term twitches, bird watchers. In no. Britain, we, call, they, we call them twitches. So my grandfather, like earliest memories is like age seven being taken to Oxford Town Hall for a, for a, 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 a Super 8 screening on a projector of, of a film just about ospreys. And I grew, I grew this love of, of birds. Now I'm not, I reacted against it in my teens. 
you know, I would much rather be in a city. I'd much rather go and travel around America by yeah. Greyhound, you know, blah, blah. But um, so, yeah, that was really, I was asked to just, just that, because I think people are aware of, I, I wasn't, uh, a friend of mine, Sam Lee, they basic, he basically wrote this song, uh, wrote this piece of music through Birdsong. And he asked, would I help uh, be a part of it to celebrate? Because our numbers are dwindling hugely in Britain. You know, we've got some, some of the stats are off the wall. In my lifetime, in 40 years, uh, 40 years plus, the, the, you know, bird, I think the bird numbers are down 40%. Yes, and a lot, too. Yeah, and a lot of it is actually, is actually there's, there's the climate change, obviously, but a lot of it is also, you find out these awful things like in France, in, and I love France, and I love the French, but there's tradition in the south of France that when the birds are migrating in autumn, from the Northern Hemisphere down to the Sahara, it's a tradition that they go out and shoot these birds as they're flying south. So this, things like this have really taken a toll because more and more people do it and they think, well, it's our right to do this. You know, this is what we've always done. So I was just trying to, that was all, it was all part of a, a kind of a, a campaign to shed light on the fact that how important bird life is and how the numbers are, being reduced but i think what was amazing and you probably had the same thing in, in the first lockdown the thing that we were aware of we were in wales was the bird song which started at about five o'clock in the morning and it i i i i i i i because I, I, I had covid at the time so i spent a lot of time i couldn't listen to music couldn't but i'd hear the bird song and and i i said i said these birds are happier than they've ever been. We might be in lockdown and, you know, feeling the effects and life has ground to halt, but the birds are loving it. You know, they really, they really enjoy it. No, I noticed that. I definitely Did you notice that noticed. too? Yes. And up here at dawn uh, in the spring, oh. it is so loud. There are a hundred birds outside my house. It is incredible, you know, and at dusk as well. And I have a lot of, we have three North American imitative birds, uh, imitators, which are the uh, brown thrasher, the mockingbird, and the catbird. I have a lot of catbirds here, and they will imitate things they've heard. At the end of the day, they will sort of regurgitate wow. the sounds they've heard, and they will include like sort of a phone ringing or a truck backing up or people yelling at each other. I mean, it is amazing. Oh, they, uh, I love those birds. I love, I have a lot of woodpeckers of different types too, which I just love woodpeckers. But uh, yeah, yeah those, the birds here are ama amazing. It's so, and I, it was different since this lockdown. Things yeah. change. But I have a lot of animals up here. You know, I have bears and, yeah, and wow. boy wolves and wild turkeys and deer and foxes and raccoons and, you know, lots of animals around here. So it's pretty it's, wild, but the birds so, so beautiful. It's amazing. I, I never come across an imitator bird before. And I, only, I, I remember my first time I ever heard, I was, I was staying in the middle of summer in, in, in a, place that was down in Siwatanejo in Mexico in between tours North American tours back in the mid 90s I'd always having seen um uh oh, the, that great film where they end up in Siwatanejo um uh anyway I some will remember the, the the I'm terrible with film names anyway I, I end up in Siwatanejo and every day at 5 30 there was this scream and this shouting, and it sounded like someone was being literally murdered. And I was like, first, and you know, be, it's five o'clock in the afternoon, so you had a siesta, and you're sort of waking up, and it's really humid, it's really hot, middle of summer in Siwataneo. And you'd hear this noise, like, what the fuck is, you know, and I, Jesus, and I, I was like, then it happened the next day, and I was like, what's, and then the third day it happened, and I was like, okay, this is weird, this is exactly on the dot at five o'clock. So I go outside, <laughs> And there, sitting on a tree in this kind of courtyard of this house, was this bird. <laughs> it's, they're amazing and they're extraordinary creatures. Have you, um, have you, uh, do you know your birds? Have you got into spotting them? Can you? Have yeah. you yeah, wow. yeah, I know my birds around here pretty well. Although I have friends that can identify 
a bird song, a certain warbler by yeah. sound that you won't even see. You know, I'm not that good, but yeah. vis visually I'm very good. I, I can identify many, many birds now. Did you, um, you know, uh, Olivia Messiaen, the French, you probably know that. that he yes, the piano he, piece's transcription of bird songs. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Beautiful, aren't they? Yeah. Well, listen, Jim, I won't keep you any longer. It's been really lovely, you know, to Well, thank you, you, man. I, and I wanted to say uh, thank you for your beautiful record, Earth, too. Uh, oh. it's very, the very beautiful things on there, you know. I like how you mix up even some... There's one Olympic that's got a very kind of funky rhythm. Yeah. And other things are very atmospheric and uh, it's just a very, very beautiful record. But thank you for all you do. Thank you, Jim, for all you do. And I hope that we can meet up and I can give you, I'd love to give you a guitar pedal or two. Well, I just like, I'd be happy <laughs> to talk to you about anything, anytime. I like the, your digressions too, because that's Great. what I, that's my middle name, digress. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, best of luck at this time. And I hope, you know, you, you and your family stay well and safe and, you know, look Thank forward you. To, to, to a more a brighter next four years. Yeah, or maybe a friend of mine said recently, I hope this new year is boring. <laughs> Amen to <laughs> we'll that. See, we just got, uh, you know, we got a big uh, dark cloud lifted off of us with our uh, presidential situation here. So... Yeah, there's a kind of uh, everyone feel feeling a little relief, a little breathing room for a second here. Yeah, and and thank you as well for your films, man. Like, you know, I, I'm sure people thank you a lot, but I think particularly at this time, having had a little kind of Jim Jarmusch season with my wife, I've really, really appreciated it anymore. And it's been like a really, it's been like, you know, it's it's been a real help. And I'm not just saying that; it's been a real kind of to enter. To enter your world of film has been, you know, we're, we're, gonna, we're carrying on with it. There are a number that we, we need to see again. So thank you for all your amazing work and your exploration and what, what you do for us, you know. Well, th thank you, Ed O'Brien. I really appreciate <laughs> it. Nice to talk with you. Nice to talk to you, Jim. All the best. All right. And people should check out this book, Stompbox. Yeah, Stompbox. We didn't talk too much about it, but it's uh, really interesting. It's a really beautiful piece of work. Yeah. All right, man. All right, Jim. Thanks. You too. Good luck. Thank you. That was very cool. I was a little bit nervous beforehand. <laughs> I must admit, but thank you, Jim. Um, that was cool. I didn't mean, I meant to ask how we can get to see Ghost Dog because you can't get Ghost Dog on, on the platforms I'm watching on. Anyway, that's not important. It was really, really cool. Um, all right. Thank you, everybody. I hope uh, you enjoyed that. Um, I really did. It was really cool. Um, yeah, I'm blown away. Ziggy's scratching at the window. She's been outside. She's, she's, she's shivering. So I'm going to get her back into the house. All right, guys, big love and um, see you next week. All right, take care. Be kind to yourself and be kind to one another.